October the 13th is Baptismal Sunday, yeah. and next Sunday is church breakfast at 9.30. Nine. What? It says 9.30 right there. Nine o'clock. Wait, wait, wait. We need to figure this out. Well, you're cooking. Is it 9 o'clock or 9.30? Well, are, we, are we doing uh, baptisms next week? Is that why it's a different time? Or? No, I just put it in the wrong. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Now, I didn't know. Church, church breakfast at 9 o'clock unless Robert's late. Then it'll be 9.30, all right? Okay, we got, that, we got that sorted out. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Everybody, have, they, have you selected the Sunday that we're going to wear yeah, pink? It'll be the last Sunday of the month, which is the 27th. That's the day after what they're now calling a walk, no longer a common race. Okay, so the last... The 27th. The, 20, the 27th, and... Pictures are going up. We've got pictures of those who have uh, passed on or are suffering under breast cancer. Bring them in, put them up on the board. Anything else you'd like to say about that? Um, you, did, you did really good. I was excited that you're, you're getting it finally. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yes, if you've got pictures of somebody that is near and dear to you that's either fighting breast cancer or is a breast cancer survivor, um, please bring that picture so that we can recognize it. The one picture out there of Val Zay, her daughter is friends with a uh, friend Carolyn and myself. She is a three-time breast cancer survivor, and her her motto is, you can't keep a good German down. So she's, just, she's amazing. Um, so bring your pictures, and let's get them up on the board, and then wear your pink. Also, I want to go backwards a little bit to the food for kids. This year, we kind of didn't get a lot of food, so it's not the kind of donation that I'm real proud of, but it's better than nothing. If you still want to contribute, either give cash to Tina, write your check, note on your check today, whatever you want to do, but I'm right now begging for more help for the BB and Cabin School District. It hits home when Barbara and I went and did the Pack the Shack, Feed the Funnel, when they said one in five kids in this area doesn't know where the next one is coming from. And so we want to help feed those kids. Yes, Cabot now has free breakfast for everybody, but for some kids that's the only meal that they get that day. So please, if you can do anything, you want to bring food, you want to donate money, donate check, whatever, please do that. Anybody else have anything that's not in the bulletin they would like to uh, bring up? Birthdays that need to be sung in? Yeah.
What kind of uh, praises do we got this morning? Maybe you want to share? I have a praise for a guy that doesn't like to hear it. But uh, last Sunday morning, as I was headed out to church, uh, I decided to demonstrate how much of a putt I am. I fell off my sidewalk into the bushes and dislocated my shoulder. Uh, Robert Buffin was there to uh, uh, pick me up for church. Robert stood by me and uh, made sure that I got on the ambulance and came back and, and came back and got me from UAMS and all that. It's as painful as it sounds, and I haven't been through this before, but um, once uh, once they gave me the right message and started getting better by yesterday, it really doesn't hurt anymore, I believe. Amen. Amen. Proud of Robert. I said he hit you. I had to pick you up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any other praises, guys? Yes. I got a new job this week at Kennedy Hospital. I'm very excited to go speak that. So. That's that's a that's a whole got a whole life ahead of you now. So hope you keep your sanity. That's all. Yes. I can yes. Stay eight weeks behind the organ. Yeah. Yeah. We've been, we've been missing that spot. Anybody else got yes? Hey, Jane. Uh, anybody on Facebook knows that his grandson Mason was at a hospital, had been in the hospital with pneumonia, and he is home now and doing better. So we continue to keep prayer. You can just tell by looking at him, we knew him. He didn't have to say he was sick. You can just tell by looking at him. He, just he, wasn't, he wasn't bouncing, so it's probably no, a good sign. Yeah. All right. He may have. I know we got lots of prayer concerns, but who needs, who needs to start off? Ken, how about your mama? Good. Keep my mom in prayer. Anybody else this morning? I got concerned where's that mic? <laughs> I told you it disappeared. Did he find it? No. Did you find it? He found it. Good deal. It was MIA. Where was it at? It was in that cabinet in the foyer. <coughs> We'll switch in a minute. Oh, I, I got a quick praise yeah. in response to the previous prayer concerns. My friend Randy Johnson, who has been struggling in and out of the hospital for the last couple of years, he, uh, I think Monday he had a pacemaker installed. And uh, he just seems to feel a whole lot better. And he's, he's working on getting his health up. He for, for two years he's been promising to come to breakfast with us and come visit our church. And... Uh, here in the near future, he should be down here to join us. So that's that's a. Well, I got two prayer concerns. Well, actually, three. So three of them out there. Um, one of them is the guy I work with, who's about 30 years old, has cancer. Kind of reminds me of Nathaniel's situation, and uh, I just keep praying that his his turnout won't be the same. But it, it's been a long, hard battle. And at least he was still able to get treatment, which Nathaniel didn't. Most able to get at the very end. So his name is Ricky Fondo, and uh, we need to keep him in our prayers. And then um, one of them is somebody that you, the church knows, and that is uh, Jay's son, Timmy. And, and, and it's, 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 a, it's a physical problem, but it's also just a, a mad at the world, you know, problem. And we, we need to be in prayer for him as another person. And then uh, the last one, I'm going to throw this out there, because this is my church, and you guys love me, and you put up with and you put up with me, and we're family, so I can share things with you that I wouldn't share with anybody else. But my, uh, when me and my wife got married, I took on three boys, and uh, two of them lived with me, and we, I was able to, well, the third one did live with me at the very beginning. Um, and the two of them have gone on to be productive members of society, and I was able to influence them and keep them in church, and, you know, that church matters, as Larry says, he got to go to church, it doesn't matter. But, um, the third one, the, the father took him away through, as parents of course do, we took him to Disneyland and did all these things with him, and he went to live with his dad. Well, he's now 20 years old and a drug addict, and uh, it's something I'm probably going to have to deal with, and he'll probably come to Arkansas, and because of what I do on Thursday nights and the other things I'm involved with, I have the best resources to get him back on the straight and narrow. I don't know when he's going to be. Uh, ready to actually do that because you just don't do it. It's something you've got to be ready to do. So 
we need to be in prayer for him. His name is Walker Irvin. I don't know if he's ever been to this church. Did Walker ever come? Walker did come. Yeah, Walker did come. Okay. So that is the world we live in, folks. And it's so easy to get off on the wrong path. And I'm so proud of people like Bailey and others in our congregation that just stayed the course and stayed in the straight and narrow. And it is so easy to step off in that world. And, and uh, what's so sad and doesn't make any sense, I mean, me and my wife talk about this a lot, the drugs that they put out in the world today kill people the first time they use them. So I'm like, that's like, I mean, from a business standpoint, do you want to kill your customers? I mean, it's just, we don't, we don't even understand it, but I mean, it is where we are. This is the world we live in. So kids, stay away from this stuff. It just, it ain't worth it. it I don't care who you are. It will ruin your life and it will ruin everybody around you's lives as well. So I did this stuff kind of my soapbox for this morning, but we need to be in prayer for those people. There's a lot of people that we know, and I know you, can, you probably won't mention them. I was just brave enough to mention mine. But we need to be in prayer for people. I mean, we are a church. We're here to love and take care of each other and pray for people, you know? So anybody, any other prayer concerns this morning that I just left out? Yes? Amory's boyfriend, Brian, that visits us occasionally. His younger brother, 16, was in a pretty rough car accident on Friday. Had to be met flighted to Memphis. He's broken in a lot of areas. We're just praying right now for an actor had trauma. And then also just pray for Amory to um, show God and her faith. Let your light shine. Emory is a bright person, and that's, that's it. I mean, she's bright. She's bright this way, but she's also a bright Christ, and I'm glad she is, because she shows people Jesus, and I'm so proud of her. Anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I do mean, Father, we thank you for this time here this morning that we can be here. We thank you for the fact that Jesus loves us, and he died on the cross for us. And I know we, we struggle greatly at times with the things that are in our lives and thrown upon us, but there's nothing we can't bear with you. There's nothing we can't get through. And there, we have people like Jimmy and Barry and, and Ken's mom, and, and, and just it goes on and on, people we need to pray for. But we also have people, younger people, people with real serious emotional, physical, and other kinds of problems that we need to be a part of and reach out to and love on and take care of. And, and that goes for everyone in this crowd today. I mean, we all have someone that we need to be praying for daily because there's nothing more powerful than the prayer of someone who's, and you, just, you just need to cry out to God. And we'll talk about that later in the sermon. But Lord, just... Just bless this place today. Let us, let us understand who you are and whose we are so that we might live our lives in ways that matter, Lord. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. 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 So I'll turn to page number 85. <laughs>
and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
to us and for us. You weren't going to back down. You were going to carry your your life and, and go through all that torture and all those things. And you were saying, look, I'm going to do this for you. And so now I ask that you would forever do this in remembrance of me. And that's what we do here this morning, Lord, to remember you and what you did for us on the cross. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We lift up, sorry, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right, a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. With your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join your unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. On the night which he gave himself up for us, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave the cup to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for me for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died, Christ, Christ is risen, risen, and Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. They be, may be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in the ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit, and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are at Pentecostal Church this morning. They're speaking in tongues on the first row. The table is set. Y'all please come forward. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come this morning and what a wonderful sound to hear a baby in the background. You know, the future of the church is our children, but we also are your children. And we come this morning, this morning humbly and asking for you to bless us and to raise us to be your children even now. In our old age, Lord, help us to guide us and lead us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
we sit here this morning remembering what Christ did for us. I'm so thankful that we are, have the time to humble ourselves just for a moment to remember what he did. He calls us to live humble lives and to live as he is, people who know who he is, as people who love like he loved. And I just ask you, Lord, if we carry that love with us as we leave here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we we fulfill scripture when we take communion. And Lord, we know that you will fulfill all the promises that you made us. And we just need to stand on that every day of our lives. And Lord, just bless us and keep us and empower us to do your will. In Jesus' name we do pray.
I ran off and left my notes this morning because I didn't have my bride. So y'all get, I was trying to condense time this morning, but I guess y'all are just messed up because now I'm just going to run wild. But anyway. We got all day. Uh, um, the scripture I chose that's in the bulletin is more about the series that we're doing than today. And I'm just going to go ahead and use it because it's handy. But, uh, but as we go through Samuel, you'll figure out that God looks at people way different than we, than we look at people. And this is what he says in 1 Samuel 16 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or his physical stature, because I refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. It's a great scripture, and we need to get it. We need to understand it because. You know, in, in our story today, we're going to find people who were in power, people in position, people who you would say, well, that's the person I want to go to. That's the person that is the man to, to go to talk to. But uh, it's a crazy story in 1 Samuel. And we have come around the world to get back. I mean, I have come around the world for sure. But I didn't know where I was going to come back to and what I was going to preach on when I got back. And last week, I was still in the fog. I wasn't even here. Y'all just left me have a body up on the stage. But but uh, what happened was is God led me back to First Samuel for a bunch of reasons. But you know we went through the entire book of Judges, and Samuel is the very last judge. But by far, he's the most important judge, prophetically and, and everything else, because he is the one that gets us to the point where we meet David, and David is in the line of Jesus Christ Himself. So that's kind of kind of where we are, and um, and he's important enough. But he's actually mentioned, if I, if I was smart enough to mark my pages, let me see if I can find it. Hold on. Since I didn't bring the notes. Yeah. Y'all forgive me. One thing God told me in my time in Israel, I've always rushed and rushed and rushed to get get through everything I'm doing on Sunday morning like I have to get it all out of me or you aren't going to get it. And actually I was talking about Jeremiah, not Nehemiah. In Jeremiah chapter 15 it says, Then the Lord said to me, Even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, my mind would not be favorable toward his people. So the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and he said, even if Moses and Samuel, so in other words, Samuel is that important of a character that those two people are mentioned about all the people. You know, we did the Hebrews 11 thing where we talked about the hall of faith and who's famous in God's eyes. Well, evidently, Moses and Samuel are pretty famous. And so we're going to talk about Samuel. The interesting story about uh, Samuel has to do with a woman, and her name is Hannah. And we're going to go to uh, 1 Samuel. But let's have a quick prayer. I dream, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the fact that what you say is true. You only have to travel to those places and, and see and hear the stories and, and just and look at the amazing things that happen there and, and understand that the Bible is true and, and your word is true. And Lord, help us to take it to heart as we go forward from here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, so this is a crazy story. And there's so many parallels with other stories, but I'm going to start off with your memory. I want you to think about Mary, the mother of Jesus, when you think about Hannah. I want you to think about Samson as the photonegative of Samuel. Because we just got through Samson not long ago, and you realize he was not a very good guy. But you'll see the, this exact same story happening again. And you have to understand that Samson would have been a hero at this time. He would have been someone that you would have wanted to, to, to model your life after as far as he a biblical hero in that sense. I'm not saying how he lived, but, but the things he accomplished. So for the Jewish people, he was a hero because he whooped up on the Philistines and they were delivered from them. So here we are at the, the very last judge, which leads to the time of the kings. And the bad thing about going from the time of the judges to the time of the kings, you are swapping the kingdom of heaven and God's reign for your ultimate governmental body for an earthly king. You're trading. You can't tell me that 
having God as your king is not better than having a man as your king. But this is what the people wanted. And here we are, the same exact story as where we were with Samson. The whole world's fallen apart. They've fallen away from God. There's all these same problems that the Israelites always go through. But this story is a lot different in, um, in, in how it ends and even a little bit how it begins. So we'll start off with verse 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramallah, Sophon, on the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jerome, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zeph, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Let's stop right there. It was never okay to have more than one wife in biblical history, just so you know. It was never okay. It was never something God allowed or thought was good. What we believe is that because Benina, I mean, because Hannah could not have more of children, then then, he's, then Elkanah would seek another wife so he'd have children. Now we have to understand, and my kids can get this, I have nobody to feed the chickens if I don't have kids. You get it? I mean, that's the deal. The culture was agriculture, and if you don't have any kids, you have no workers. And more so than that, you have no heirs. So it's very important to have children. The, the problem is, Elk and I did not reach out to God for help. He didn't pray to God. He didn't. It wasn't who he reached out to to help him in his situation. He fixed it himself. Do we do that? Do we, instead of reaching out to God, we like take the shortcut? And of course, you know, many times in the Old Testament, when they would marry that other wife, oh my Lord, all kinds of problems would come with it. Even problems that we're dealing with still today. But I think about God was very wise because who wants to meet the needs of two women? I must be very honest. That is not something men are designed to do, to emotionally, physically, whatever. We are not in us to do that. So God is smart. I mean, he really is in, 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 in making that rule. Um, so let's go back to verse 3. This man went up from the city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. I'll stop right there. I stood in Shiloh, I guess about a week ago or so, maybe 10 days ago, and uh, I had a rabbi give me a tour of the whole place. And uh, he, had a, he explained everything as he went. And I'll show the video next week. I didn't want to do it on communion Sunday. He gave, a little, he gave a little talk before we did it. They actually pronounced it Shiloh. So we kind of have some Southern English and, and rabbi translation is difficult. And, and we'll talk about that next week too. But anyway, it, it was interesting. But the Ark of the Covenant sat in that place in the tabernacle for 14 years before they blew it and the Philistines took it like they always did. And it stayed somewhere for hundreds of years after that. But anyway, that's kind of kind of where they worshiped and where they went down to. Uh, Shiloh is 15 miles north of Jerusalem, so it's not a long way from where the where the eventual holy temple was built and all that. It's not very far. But interestingly enough, Shiloh was the first place that there was ever a tabernacle. It's the first place they ever had a place to worship together in one spot. And uh, the word actually means placenta. So think about the fact that this is where you know everything began and how important it is in Jewish history that we're reading this today and talking about it. But anyway, so go back to the story. Also, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priest of the Lord, were there. Now, before I get too much into that, these were some bad people. Those two priests were horrible, absolutely the worst kind of people. And it's kind of interesting that you'll see that the the, the contrast between the characters here. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year as they went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. Okay, so you've got a woman who's, who really, really loves God. I mean, she is all in for God. But she is being provoked by this other wife because the other wife is jealous because she actually has the love of her husband. He gives her a double portion of everything. 
God is blessing her in, in many, many ways, but she is being beat up, I guess you'd say, spiritually in the sense that she's beating her down about the fact she doesn't have any kids. In that culture at that time, if a woman did not have children, it was like they had sinned in some way against God, and she had not done so. It was just that, and so it grieved her heart for anyone to think that she didn't love God with all her heart. It grieved her heart that she didn't, that she couldn't produce children because it just was the, it was the perception on the street was that, that you had done something wrong, and it was not the case. So Hannah, in verse 8, makes a vow. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Of course, this is the wrong thing for a husband to say, by the way. Am I not better to you than ten sons? You got a woman who's really distressed and really distraught. And instead of being empathetic, say, well, you got me. I don't think that was probably the thing to say. So Hannah rose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. And now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat of the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look upon my affliction of your maidservant and remember me and for not forget your maidservant, but you will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. Remember that from, got it? He's a Nazarite. She knew that being a Nazarite was a big deal, donating your son to be a part of the priesthood, a part of, the, of, of that world, because she knew about Samson. She knew about, in this version of the story, you actually have a guy who wants to live by the Lord's ways. And, and so you have this total other story. Now what's crazy is, the priesthood is all messed up now. It's not the people, it's the priesthood. And it's, and it's also interesting, if you remember in the other story with Samson, the parents were kind of forgiving. They would like go with the children down to, and go with Samson down to the horrible places and then like reinforce their bad behavior so and say, we can't go there, you shouldn't do that. I mean, they would mention it to him, but they would go with him to these horrible places they weren't supposed to go. This is not where she is at. This is not where her walk is. She is all in to give this child to God. So verse 12, it says, And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli washed her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Don't let anybody ever judge you on how you worship God. That's the what that's my takeaway from that. If you want to raise your hands in here, if you want to sing loud, if you want to shout, whatever, I know that's not this church. But it's okay. Don't let anybody say, because I mean I've been to churches where that's like that, and you got the old guy in the back who's always doing it, and people don't want to sit near him because it's gonna burst out any minute, you know. But that's okay. That's how he worships. Let him worship that way. Don't judge him for that. And what's so crazy about this is Eli's two sons are priests. They have, they're an abomination to God. They are ruining the reputation of the church. And he is judging her for how she worships. And he will not judge his own children who don't know how to serve God. Isn't that how people are? I mean, that's just, it's just crazy. It's kind of a... Those are my kids, so they're perfect. It's okay. And I'll let them have it. Okay, verse 16. And of course, they use, she, she's using the word maidservant. And it literally means she's calling herself just a, a humble slave. She's, 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 she's saying, I'm worthless. I'm nobody. I mean, she keeps using that word. And you'll find that Mary uses the same a version of this prayer when she prays after she meets Martha about being pregnant with Jesus. It's the same, very similar prayer. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. Hold that right there. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. 
what she is saying is, I'm finally believing that I'm going to receive. She's changed her attitude. She's changed her She hasn't seen anything yet. But she's accepting the fact that something is coming. God is going to do something about this. Do you ever, any of you, ever find yourself finally at peace about something? It hadn't happened yet, but you prayed about it. You gave it to God, and you finally said, okay, I'm at peace with this now. And that's where she is. She says, you know what? I'm at peace now. And so then Eli answers and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. And the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Can you do that in the worst of situations? Can you trust God so much that it no longer bothers you? Think about that for a minute. No matter what it is, now she cried out in a way that is the ultimate crying out. And in my own personal life, there are two times in my life where I cried out to God like that, and God answered. One of them is with my son Joshua. Y'all know that story. There are others that are more selfish. I'd say it like that, financial or otherwise, things that have happened. But when I cried out hard enough, and I was in that place, and I trusted God to handle it, it got handled. And we all need to be in that place. That's why she is such an amazing person for us to look at. Now, verse 19. Then they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came home to their house at Ramah. Okay, let me stop up also. Hannah did not have to go up and worship at the temple. It was only the men. But she loved God so much she went every time. Think about that for a moment. That she that was kind of outside the character of people, but she would go. And Elkanah saw new Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked for him from the Lord. So you need that. If, if God's ever blessed you with something that you ask for, you call that thing Samuel, whatever it is. Now the man Elkanah and his house went up to offer the Lord the yearly sacrifice in his vow. But Hannah did not go up. For she said to her husband, Now, not until this child is weaned, that then I will take him, and he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. And so Elkanah, her husband, by the way, in that culture, that's three or four years old. They, it's a long time for weaning. It's not what we think around here where you got to get back to work. It's a different situation. So Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait till you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. Then the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her and three bulls, one ephah of flour, a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young, and they slaughtered the bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. For this child I pray, and the Lord has granted me my petition which I ask of him. Therefore, I have also lent him to the Lord as long as he lives, shall he be lent to the Lord. So they worship the Lord there. And we get about to get to Hannah's prayer in just a second. This is where we get the idea of dedicating a child in church, is from this scripture. If you notice, there's no baptism, there's no water, and that's nowhere found in scripture. I think it's one of those where. Religion got involved and you wanted to make a point. You wanted to see, uh, have some outward sign of what's going on. But, but this is taking a child and dedicating them to the church. Every parent here that brings their child every Sunday, including grandmother who brought that knucklehead over there as he gives <laughs> his testimony. Um, he's given that testimony a couple of times. That is dedicating a child to God. Now, just to not get, I'm not, I didn't bring all my notes, but I know where the stuff is. But um, they're like, so there's nothing in there about water. And we're going to do baptism next week. Um, and I just want you to be aware that in the Bible, dedication of children to God is just taking them to church and, and making them part of the family of God. That's what we do. In 1 Corinthians 7, I'm going to try to turn there and find it. There is this idea that the children that you pray over, and are a part of the house of God, are washed or blessed or are kept from harm, or basically the word would be protected if they should perish. In other words, they become a part of the family of God. 
we have this idea of the age of accountability where if a child passes away that they are going to go to heaven. The Bible does not say anything whatsoever specifically about children who are not of a Christian home. That are not under the blood, or under the under the blessing, and under under the tutelage, under the who are not dedicated to the church. Now, I'm not saying it. our God is fair, but I'm just telling you there's nothing. Religion likes to add a lot of things to the, to the book, and I'm saying that our God is fair. And I'm not worried about little kids. I think it's taken care of, but it's not written anywhere. The only thing written in Scripture about children and their being blessed and covered by is because they bring their children and make them a part of the church, just like this happened right here. So. Brought your kids to church, you ain't got to worry about where they go until they get the age of accountability. Pretty simple stuff. Just wanted you to understand that, especially since we're going to try to do baptism next week. Um, I guess any of you have questions about that, see me next after church. Um, but it's really cool, this story. You have a woman who is so faithful, whose prayer life is so strong, and, and she does more than you can ever imagine for the future of the church because she creates the line of Jesus Christ by having this child because he's the one who brings the anointing, her anointing on her life passes to her son Samuel who passes to Saul and also to David and so I mean this is a very important, I mean, we, we, she's just a little lady at this point probably but she is the woman who creates the, the, the power of God because God put her in a situation where she had a need God did make her barren for a time, for a reason, to accomplish his will with her. That is us too. There are things that will come into our lives. There are things that will keep us from being able to accomplish what we want to accomplish until the time God wants to accomplish them. But we're, we're not supposed to be like Elkanah and take a shortcut and try to work around it ourselves and have a wife who gives us kids. We're supposed to reach out to God and in his time and in his season, he will give us the answer to our prayers and bless us much more than we ever could be by doing it ourselves. So you see that in that story. It's a very simple story, but it's, it's amazing what is going on here. And, 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 and the, there are eternal repercussions from the fact that she prayed for her son and that she gave him to the Lord. And I would tell you that even for your own children, there are eternal repercussions for the fact that you would pray for your children and give them to the Lord. It's the same thing. Now, now Hannah, her prayers are amazing. And I'm going to real quickly, I want to turn to Psalms, if I can find myself a place here. Because I thought about this song. Come on. Middle. By the way, Psalms is always dead center in the Bible. I left my big Bible behind too, so I'm having one of them days. But Psalm 27, I'm reminded of when I when I hear her story. And if, if you, I know people who pray the Psalms every night. This is an excellent one. There's many of them, but it says, "The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength of life." Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, this and this I will be confident. I'm not going to go through all of that. But that's her situation. She is being barraged every day by this woman, saying, You got his love, but I got your children. I got children for him, and you'll never be able to do that. The strongest weapon against any enemy we ever have is prayer. There's nothing, we, we don't, as Christians, we don't have another weapon. We're not allowed to do this, you know? We're not allowed to do people in. We're not allowed to fight like that. Our prayer, our weapon is prayer. It is amazing how strong it can be. I, you know, I don't think about it sometimes with the things that have happened in my life. We have great hindsight. You know, you can see it back and say, wow, God really did whoop on that person for me. You know, I didn't realize they did it until later, but I mean, I know that in my job world, I know in my secular world, I know in my church world, I know all of those things. 
I can see that where people who have tried to harm me and it grieved my soul greatly, later on they they had a lot of bad luck. And I'll just say it like that. I'm not wishing anybody bad luck. That's not the point. We have to have the right heart in those situations. And if you notice, Hannah never had a negative thought whatsoever against Penina. You get it? She prayed to God for a son that she could give to him. She didn't pray for God to knock her dead or strike her with lightning or run her over by a car, which we probably do sometimes. But but you realize that was where her heart was. See where I'm at tomorrow, okay? I got a lot to go on this. We're going to stop this morning because this is commission, it's communion Sunday, and then next week I'm, I'm kind of going to tie all this together probably with the baptism thing we're going to be doing. Um, if you have any questions about the baptism, I now have been sprinkled, dumped, washed, good man, a couple times. I don't, you know, there, there is, religion says that we can't have more than one baptism in some places. But there's also situations in the Bible where people just got baptized to repent. And I think, if nothing else, if you're trying to, to move on to the next phase of your life, your spiritual life, probably baptism is a good thing. But it requires a commitment and repentance. And, that, and that's the thing, that if you want to do this, that's all I ask, is to not be something totally ceremonial. You need to have your heart in it if you're going to do it. No different than taking communion this morning. So if you decide you want to do it, that's wonderful. If only one person does it, which might just be my wife, she wants to do it, that's fine too. Um, but what I find is, is 10 people show up to baptize, and the other 41 get baptized too. I pray that happens. I'd like the whole place to get wet, just if we need to. Just for a commitment to this church, commitment to Jesus, commitment to our own lives, and move forward to the next thing. That's it, that's it. Um, but as we leave Hannah this morning, what a pure heart. What a, what a woman whose prayer was heard by God, but you have to understand the kind of prayer it was. She had been tortured by this woman. And it says year after year after year she was tortured. And what she was tortured about was the idea that people thought that she in some way did not love God, did not serve God, did not do the things you need to. We'll talk a lot more about the other things of that next week. But um, that's the right kind of heart. If you don't want anybody to think that you don't love God, that's a place to be. And it should show in your lives every day. Amen? <laughs> Let us pray. Dear and Father, we thank you for the fact of, of Hannah's example. You know, what a blessing she, she was and the things that she put in motion. And of course, God put them in motion by making her barren by making her need, have a need to give to him. Lord, help us to understand that everything we have is yours. And in Hannah's case, all she did was return what he gave her. And that's the same thing we do when we give anything to God. Our time is probably the most important thing we can give God because God doesn't need money. Now, money is the currency of this world and God wants to use it to bless others, and I get that. We're supposed to give, and, and, and to be blessed, we need to give. But our time, and our service, and our witness is so much more important in God's kingdom. And I just pray that we would become a church that, that would always reach out to those in need, always share about Jesus Christ, and always be a light into the world. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Amen. I'll stand and turn to page 104.
Well, as y'all leave here today, I hope y'all have a little bit of the spirit of Hannah. You know, it's hard to fathom in that culture, women didn't have much of a role, didn't have much of a place. And the priest in that story had the ultimate role and the ultimate power. But the power came from her prayers. The power that would change the whole world came through what she did. And God put her in a situation where she had to reach out to him. Just remember that when you have a bad day. Sometimes there's a bigger story going on. I ask as you leave here today that he would bless you and that you would understand his will for your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.